Welcome to CS Guitars, the science of loud. Now, I may not be James Bond, but I have been recruited by Reverb to participate in a challenge of extraordinary consequence to the sonic prosperity of Britain, and perhaps even the world. My mission, should I choose to accept it, is to create the most British sound ever. Reverb have selected four secret agents, music influencers here in the UK, to each craft a composition inspired by a British musical genre with a Shakespearean song title using a mystery piece of music gear supplied by a British manufacturer. In Reverb's mission briefing, which of course was set to self-destruct after 40 seconds, they provided me with the song title Double Double Toil and Trouble, of course from Macbeth, the mystery piece of gear of a Ranger Effects minibar, a fun little overdrive pedal with a quirk that we'll talk about later, and a musical genre that makes my wee anarchist heart jump for joy, British punk. You'll be able to vote for the song that you think best encompasses the most British sound, and doing so will put you into the running to win the Ranger FX minibar and the three other instruments used by secret agents David Bennett, Rachel Collier and Alex Ball. Links to that will be in the description and of course the pinned comment. Let's get started by bringing ourselves up to speed with exactly what British punk should sound like. In the mid-1970s, the UK was simply not prepared for what the initial wave of British punk bands were going to unleash on the world of music. The volume, the aggression, the attitude and the anti-establishment sentiments were shocking despite all of those pieces being in play almost a decade before. Bands like the Sex Pistols, The Clash, The Damned, The Slits and Susie and the Banshees were building on the sounds and lyrical contents of acts that came before, like The Kinks, The Who, Led Zeppelin and Hawkwind. They adopted an anti-music writing style, keeping things three chord simple and spitting lyrics that were shocking or would confront real world problems and injustice. The guitars were beyond loud and fuzzy, inspired by the Kinks taking razor blades to their speaker cones. The vocals weren't pretty and didn't shy away from laying bare the problems in Britain at the time. Strikes, mass unemployment, rioting and a government unable to lead. All of which sounds remarkably similar to the post-Brexit Britain I live in today. And the band who caused the biggest stir in all of it were the Sex Pistols. Anarchy in the UK was a call to arms for a youth angry and frustrated, inspiring them to grasp control for themselves in a country that had taken so much from them. The band's behaviour at shows, riling their crowds into riots, and the profanity-laden Bill Grundy television interview made them infamous in the eyes of the British media. So much so that when they released their song God Save the Queen in 1977 to coincide with the Queen's Silver Jubilee celebrations, it was denied the number one spot in the UK charts, with the BBC refusing to play the song and many retailers refusing to stock the record because of its anti-monarchy sentiments. As someone who is also very angry about the state that Britain is still in, I'm hoping I can capture just a little bit of that Sex Pistols magic in my composition. The guitar sounds accomplished by British punk bands were typically from American guitars being plugged straight into British valve amplifiers with all the controls turned up to 10. We usually see Gibson Les Pauls, both the standard and junior models, as well as Fender Strats and Tellys being used. I'll need to find two complimentary guitars from my collection that will best represent these sounds. My Les Paul gold top just didn't sound aggressive enough, so instead I've opted for the SG, as these tend to have a little more tooth in the mid-range. This guitar has recently been repaired after having the neck snapped completely off the body, and frankly, that's the most punk a guitar can be. To complement this, I've selected my Friedman Vintage T, a Telecaster Deluxe style guitar with a set of hot vintage voiced P90 pickups. It has an extremely convincing aged finish and will offer sonic contrast to the SG. Both of these guitars have a no-frills workhorse aesthetic and represent popular models from the 1970s, exactly what a British punk band might have used. I'll be pairing these guitars with the Orange AD30, a 30 watt all valve British amp head with a simple circuit design based on traditional valve amps from the 60s and 70s. Importantly for tone, this is valve rectified, meaning if we push that master volume hard enough, we'll get into power sag territory, as well as the EL84 power valves being easily driven into power amp distortion. 
The amps that British punk bands would have used didn't have a lot of preamp distortion. They were designed to stay mostly clean. So it was by maxing out the master volume and EQ controls that the power amp was pushed into distortion, which is a significantly different characteristic, grittier and less controlled than what we get by turning up the preamp gain control. The Orange AD30 has a lot more preamp distortion than many of the valve amps of the punk era, so the channel gain control is the only knob that I'm not going to turn all the way up. Accomplishing the big, nasty guitar tones of the Sex Pistols and The Clash is largely about layering two dissimilar but complementary guitar tones reinforced by a huge bass guitar. For the Freedman, I want a less distorted and more precise sound to let the details and dynamics of the P90s shine through. Plugging it straight into the AD30 and cranking the master volume will give us all the distortion we need, even with the gain control kept low. I'm using the Boss Tube Amp Expander as an attenuator, as a 30 watt valve amp on full volume is an incredibly loud thing. The attenuator allows me to max out the master volume on the amp to get that authentic punk tone without deafening myself and everyone else in Britain. The SG needs to have a thicker, more aggressively distorted sound, which is where the secret gear provided by Reverb comes in. This is the Ranger FX Minibar, a unique little overdrive unit which utilises the science of liquids to generate distortion. By pouring a liquid into this analysing chamber, the properties of the liquid's electrical conductivity and optical transparency complete the circuit to determine the gain and EQ qualities of the effect. I've run a number of experiments on different Scottish liquids to determine their conductivity and exactly what effect they will have when poured into the minibar pedal. I'll not bore you with the full details here, but if you want a deep dive into those results, then a video will be available on Patreon. Your support there is most appreciated. Ultimately, I determined that Scotch whisky, specifically Glen Morangi, gave me the sound that I was looking for, a combination of its low electrical conductivity and pale colouring. Placing this whisky overdrive unit between the SG and the amplifier provides a nasty, fuzz-like quality to the distortion. <laughs> British punk bands didn't use many effects, as there wasn't an abundance to choose from in the 1970s, and having more equipment was probably considered to be a needless complication and counter to the type of music they were trying to create. The only effects that see prominent use in the genre are distortion, phasers, and tape echo. I plan to use my Akai tape recorder as a tape echo unit for this track, both on the guitars and the vocals. <laughs> My all-purpose rock bass rig of a cheap P-Bass copy and the orange bass butler twin preamp works perfectly for achieving the huge meaty low end. The butler runs clean and distorted preamps separately into my DAW, allowing me to blend them there in post to fine tune the perfect punk bass tone.
Now, I'm not a vocalist, and even by the rough standards of some British punk, I still don't match up to the likes of a Johnny Rotten, so I'm going to be outsourcing this vocal performance. Fortunately, I know a lot of very excellent British rock bands, and I'm going to be reaching out to Massive Wagons to see if Baz has any time between festival dates and European tours to squeeze me out some proper British vocals. But before I can do that, I'll need to write some lyrics. British punk songs are far less about the technicalities of the orchestration and far more about the point they are trying to make. Therefore, I should focus on what I want my lyrics to say. Reverb have taken a massive risk in asking me to write a Sex Pistols inspired song in the same month as the grotesque extravagancies of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and all of the law breaking, resignations and votes of no confidence happening within the UK Tory government. It's going to take every fibre of my being not to turn this song into a Jonathan Pye style critique of government and monarchy. Instead, let's focus on something equally as British and problematic. A relationship with alcohol. Why do the British drink so much is a headline that I saw quite a lot in researching this topic. Pubs have historically been the cornerstone of the British social experience, but it wasn't until the 80s and 90s that excessive drinking became a prominent problem, peaking in the early 2000s with Brits drinking twice as much as they had half a century before. And it wasn't just a cultural cause, marketing had a lot to do with it. In the 1970s, Heineken began marketing their pints as refreshing to the British market, skyrocketing lager sales. This European beer that Brits had largely avoided became the main identity for male-dominated pub environments. But it wasn't just men drinking more. Women, who were often made feel unwelcome in traditional pubs, used the easier access to wine to drink at home, and drink they did, 100 bottles of wine per person per year on average at its highest. And then there was the all-important youth market. By the late 80s, young people in the rave scene were shunning pints and pubs in favour of clubs and drugs. So to compete with ecstasy, high alcohol content, colourful, fruit-flavoured alcohol pops packed with caffeine were marketed as energising, stimulating options which defined youth and underage drinking in the 90s. Drinking establishments also changed to distance themselves from the old man pub image, with many of them exploiting the concept of vertical drinking. It turns out that people drink more if they're standing up, so in came the tall tables and out went the seats. Happy hours and special deals also encouraged drinkers to drink more. As time has gone on, the intention for a UK night out has shifted from being a social experience with alcohol to almost exclusively being about getting as drunk as possible. Pre-drinking is commonplace. Turns out you can save a lot of money if you get drunk before you even arrive at the pub. And all the while, alcohol-related deaths in the UK are a huge problem. In 2019, there were an estimated 7,800 drink-drive casualties on UK roads. A similar number of people die each year from alcohol-related liver diseases, accounting for approximately 2% of all deaths in the UK. And yet we're all very proud of how much we can drink. And this is not me sitting here on my moral high horse and preaching. I am well and truly part of this problem. Throughout my 20s, alcohol and how much of it I could drink were a huge part of my identity. When I go out, I'll drink well beyond the recommended limits and often find myself with a drink in both hands. A pint of beer or cider in the left and a whiskey, a bourbon or a rum and coke in the right. If the barmaid asks if I want to make it a double, that's usually all it takes to convince me. And being Scottish, there is this cultural expectation that I am a heavy drinker, and if you've ever seen my Patreon live streams, you'll know that that's a stereotype I'm more than happy to prove correct. In fact, it's only just gone one in the afternoon here, and I'm already sipping on a Lafroig. Now, I'm not a great lyricist. I tend to state things rather factually, a consequence of my scientific brain, but that might actually be in keeping with the punk style. If I can condense everything you've just heard into a three verse structure, then we might have something that works. However, I don't want this to be seen as an endorsement of the lifestyle. As an influencer, for lack of a better term, I need to make sure I'm influencing you to make the correct decisions. So you'll find in the description links to all of my sources and to drinkaware.co.uk who have some great advice on reducing your alcohol consumption or giving up alcohol completely. If you are drinking, then please drink responsibly and know your limits regardless of what the song ends up saying. It's been a couple of weeks and I've finally got the song complete. 
Now, I was on a time limit for this, and I wanted to have a punk mantra of, if I'm thinking about it at all, I'm thinking about it too much. So the music might be a little by the numbers, and the lyrics might not be as creative or inventive as they could have been, but that's all to fit the vibe that we're going for. However, the vocal performance I got back from Baz is excellent. It really fits the style, and he's a man who knows a thing or two about drinking, being one half of the Beer Monkeys YouTube channel, which you should totally check out if you want to see a couple of proper British blokes talking shite about beer in a shed. So let's hear that final track and you can decide if I've managed to create the most British sound ever. This has been a delightful journey in attempting to recreate the sounds of British punk bands. A massive thanks goes out to Reverb for putting together such a fun experience. If you're interested in getting your hands on the Ranger FX minibar, or any of the gear I used to create this song, then you'll find links to Reverb sales pages in the description underneath this video. An enormous thanks also goes to Baz and Adam of Massive Wagons who really came through for me on this one and gave of their time despite being in the middle of playing a bunch of huge festival shows. Absolute leg ends those boys, go and stream their albums and buy some Wagons merch, links again will be in the description. And once you finish with my video, please, please jump across and check out what David Bennett, Rachel Collier and Alex Ball have created for their most British sound. They're all going to be very, very different from what I've done here and I'm excited to see their work for myself. If you want to find their channels, then you should know by now where the links will be. Don't forget to click all the buttons you're supposed to to make this video viable to the ever-changing whims of the YouTube algorithm. That's all for now. Keep it loud and stay safe.